I have already been asked if I'm going to talk long <laughs> from one of my buddies who is my conscience every now and then. And no, I'm not. I have 22 minutes. Well, no, I have 25 minutes. And I'm going to use every minute of it, I think. Well, good morning again. Last week, Pastor Nelson shared a definition of detox. That is the series that we are using through the month of January. And Pastor Nelson has a message next Sunday and the following Sunday. And let's take a look at that definition of detox. Detox, as he told us last week, is the process of abstaining from or the cleansing of unhealthy substance. Anything that we ingest, either knowingly or unknowingly, sometimes has an effect on our bodies, as well as our minds and our spirits. He pointed out that in this detox process, it's important to understand that small decisions can lead to big changes. If you remember last Sunday, he mentioned some examples from the Bible from some of the characters who had to make pre-decisions. So when the situation arose, the decision will have been made. He used Joseph as an example. He used Ruth as an example. Also Daniel and also Joshua. He also listed four areas that call for specific decision making. And those areas he pointed out are the physical, which means simply taking care of our bodies because our bodies are the temple of God taking care of our financial decision-making, knowing where and how and how much maybe to spend, maybe getting a budget. He spoke about spiritual, seeking to improve our relationship with God and thus improving our relationship with others. And then he spoke about chronological, setting a specific time to accomplish goals. If you ever worked in corporate America or in the school system or in any other company that required you to write objectives, not only for your job performance but for your own self-development, you know that time is especially important. It's not a whenever kind of something. It's not when I finish this, I'll do that. I'm often find myself in a situation like that. Get me through this, Lord, and then this is what I'll do. Sometimes I try to bargain, and you can't bargain with God. You know that time is essential when you have to set and reach a goal. Well, today we're going to look at soul detox. In Matthew 22:37, the Pharisees asked Jesus, which commandment in the law is the greatest? You know that scripture. To which Jesus replied, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. Jesus is repeating words that we find in Deuteronomy 6, 5. Repetition in Hebrew scripture and Hebrew poetry means it's important. That is a model to follow. So, if we're supposed to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind, just what is our soul? Well, there is a description for soul. It says, soul is the place where we store our emotions, our memories, our deepest thoughts and desires. And think about that. And as you think about that, I want us to hear the scripture and read the scripture from Psalm 55, verses 1 through 10. You do not have to stand for this. 
Normally it's appropriate to stand for the gospel reading, but not necessarily Old Testament readings. So let's hear those words. David says to God, give ear to my prayer, O God. Do not hide yourself from my supplication. Attend to me and answer me. I am troubled in my complaint. I am distraught by the noise of the enemy because of the clamor of the wicked. For they bring trouble upon me and in my anger, in anger they bear me bear a grudge against me. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me and horror overwhelms me. And I say, oh, that I had wings like a dove, I would fly away and be at rest. Truly, I would flee far away. I would lodge in the wilderness, Selah. I would hurry to find a shelter for myself from the raging wind and tempest. Confuse, O Lord, confound speech, for I see violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go around it on its walls, and iniquity are within it. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord remains forever. Thanks be to God. Soul detox. David was holding nothing back in praying to God. He's troubled. He's distraught. He's anxious. We've been there. He is troubled, distraught, and anxious, so much so that if he had the wings of a dove, he would flee far away and to rest in the wilderness. David needed a soul detox, and he turned to God. Now remember the definition of soul. Soul is the place where we store our emotions, memories, our deepest thoughts, and desires. And sometimes those emotions and memories pour out of us through tears, anger, shouting, and like David, a desire just to get away. I have seen so many Facebook posts of beach scenes these last several days. (laughs) And captions like, take me away. Take me away, leave me alone. Sometimes we all have those emotions. Just take me away, leave me alone, let me pull the covers over my head, and I'll be fine. Pouring out our emotions. I think it's kind of like soul searching. Have you ever done soul searching? We probably need to do it every day. It may, it may need to be a part of our daily routine. Soul searching is the deep and anxious consideration of emotions and motives. I like that word, motives, or the correctness of a course of action. Is this the right thing to do? What are my motives for doing this? Are they good? Are they bad? Will they harm someone? I need to second think this. I like the inclusion of the word motives in the definition of soul searching. What are our motives for the things we do? Are they embedded in the emotions and memories of our de- and our deepest thoughts from way, way back? Is it something that happened to us years ago that causes us to respond the way we do in certain situations? Sometimes I I wonder, I'll say to myself, where did that come from? And it could be something that was way back that I don't even remember, but it prompts an emotion or a memory from me that causes me to spring to some kind of action. 
I want to share an article with you from Reverend Dr. Terry Walton. Uh, Terry is the executive assistant to the North Georgia Bishop, Robin Deese. And Dr. Walton writes a Monday memo that is always entitled, I Was Thinking. And they're always so very interesting. I respond to them sometimes and telling him I'm not really sure about that. <laughs> and he'll respond back, he says, well, at least you read it and you're thinking about it. So we have this little banter going back and forth. The November 6th, 2023 memo focused on John Wesley's general rules, which include what we call the three simple rules. And those three simple rules are do no harm, do good, and attend upon the ordinances of God. Now, Bishop Robin, uh, Reuben Job reworded that last one to read, stay in love with God. Think about that. What do you do to stay in love with God, to stay in a closer relationship with God? Now, if you want to read the Methodist Discipline, you can find all of that list of things to read. Do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God. You can read all of those. It's interesting reading. It really is. Well, Dr. Walton focused on the first rule, do no, do no harm, by telling a story about George and Mildred. George and Mildred live in a small town. George is a quiet man, and Mildred is the, quote, self-appointed church gossip who kept sticking her nose in the other church members' private lives. She spread word that George, a new church member, is an alcoholic after she saw his truck parked in front of the town's only bar. George, a man of few words, didn't defend. He didn't explain. He didn't deny. He said nothing. He felt no one needed to know that his truck had broken down in front of the bar and he was waiting for an auto part to repair it. He simply acted. Later that evening, George quietly parked his truck in front of Mildred's house and left it there all night. <laughs> I responded to that one. I said, oh, Terry, that's a good one. Dr. Walton continues by saying that many times he's sort of like George. He wants to get even. And at other times he says that he admits that maybe he's like both Mildred and George. But he says he has a wonderful excuse for why he's that way. And he rationalizes what he calls, and this is his quote, goodness in his badness rationalize. We all do it. Many people in this church know that I like chocolate-covered cherries. I get them every year. And I rationalize. There is the box sitting on the kitchen counter. It's taking up space. I open the box. I lift a chocolate-covered cherry, and I look at it. I bite into it, and you know that stuff just drips all down your chin. It's wonderful. It's a great experience. But then that box is still on the counter, and it's taking up space. So I eat another one. Sometimes I let Bob have one or two. And then I get to the second layer, and that, that box is still on the counter taking up space. And I rationalize that I need that space for something else, so I finish off the box of chocolate-covered cherries. <laughs> to the detriment of my waistline, I have, uh, I have a semi, my AC-13, is that what it's called? AC, whatever, all that stuff. It, it's a little higher than it should be, and those chocolate-covered cherries certainly don't help in the first. So my physical being needs to be taken care of. But we all rationalize. We all attempt to say, 
but this is the right thing to do given the circumstances because sometimes we don't know all of the circumstances. It's easy. You can take us off the hook for a time, but then we remember that we weren't very wise in some of our decisions and now things are getting a little bit messy. It's like the junk drawer in my kitchen. See it? That drawer contains useful things to have in the kitchen, but it also has things I don't know what to do with. I don't want to put them in the garage because I'll never find them when Bob goes out to move things around. And besides, I rationalize that it's just so handy to have them right there in that drawer at arm's reach, whether I need them or not. They're there. So they go in the drawer. I've tried to organize. You can probably see the little boxes that I've tried to put like items in. And then pretty soon I forget the organization and I open the drawer and toss it and it lands wherever. They overflow, the containers overflow. And there's a reel of fishing line in this drawer that I have no idea why I put there or even why I have it. I don't fish. I don't know why I have the fishing line, but it's there. Take this tangled array of USB cords. You can see it right there. They are in the drawer because I can't remember which cords are compatible with our children's and grandchildren's phones and tablets. Usually one or two forget to bring their, their chargers. So I have these in the drawer just in case but we do have a square for them to plug in to the outlet. This tangled mess also reminds me of emotional responses to situations too and how we see others. Dr. Walton said in his Monday memo about George and Mildred that he needed help in seeing himself for who he really is. And once he sees himself for who he really is, he is less likely to judge and condemn someone else. Hmm. Sir Walter Scott wrote, Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Exactly. Deception isn't always about our relationship with others. Sometimes it's about our relationship with God and ourselves. If we think we can deceive God, we certainly are deceiving ourselves. He knows the emotions, the memories, the deep thoughts and the desires that affect our behavior. He knows the reason we use to excuse the things that we do. We become so entangled in things that there's no clarity when it comes time to make a decision. Maybe it's unforgiveness which turns to bitterness, or maybe worry which turns to anxiety. What about anger which turns inward and starts to eat away at your heart and your mind and your soul? Do we make comparisons which often turn to jealousy? Have we spoken hurtful words which turn to regret and we can't take them back? Now, these are only a few of the tangled negatives that affect us and those around us, as well as our relationship with God. The junk is negative. My great aunt lost a son during World War II. She blamed God, took to her bed, and never left her house again and would not permit anyone to speak God's name in her presence. Cannot imagine the deep, deep hatred that she had for someone so loving. Many of our soul problems are self-imposed. Maybe we need to take a look at Psalm 51 10, which reads, Create in me a clean heart, O God, 
and put a new and right spirit within me. Untangling the feeling, name the feeling, which brings on the problems that you have. Lord, I am one bitter person. Lord, I worry so much. I believe. Help my unbelief. Lord, I'm trying to understand, but you know I'm struggling. Lord, help me extend grace. Lord, I don't want to be like the Pharisee who criticized the tax collector. Lord, I don't want to hold on to things which interfere with my relationship with you. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and set a right spirit within me. And what a welcome change when we realize that unforgiveness can turn to contentment. Anxiety can turn to calm and confidence. Anger is no longer the inward emotion that could destroy, but becomes an understanding and eventually an acceptance of a situation, of a person even. Regret turns to acknowledgement of wrongdoing. King Josiah of Judah tried for years to do the right thing. He wanted to please God, and he felt that he had succeeded. He was considered one of the good kings in Judah. And if you remember in the Old Testament, there were very few good kings in Judah. During his reign, the temple was being restored to its former glory. Workmen found a book in one of the alcoves and took it to Josiah. He requested that the prophetess, Huldah, read and interpret for him. The book contained the law. It was the book of Deuteronomy. Josiah listened to the reading and realized that he had not been as attentive to the things God wanted him to do. Second Chronicles 34, 31 reads like this. The king stood in his place at the temple and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord keeping his commandments, his decree, and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of the covenant that were written in the book. Soul searching, soul detox is being self-aware, including our strengths and non-strengths. I don't want to say weaknesses. I want to say non-strengths, those things that can be improved upon. It's being self-aware of our abilities as well as our limits. Our limits vacillate. They change according to what's on our plate and our overall well-being. They change in, a, in an instant because of something that happens around us to which we must respond. But awareness of emotion and why we feel the way we do is important for understanding how our emotions impact our thoughts and actions. In 1944, which was a very good year, Johnny Mercer, a Georgia boy, wrote a song entitled, Accentuate the Positive. Now, nobody in here is old enough to remember that. Okay, I've heard it. And the refrain of the song is, Accentuate the Positive. Eliminate the negative, latch on to the affirmative, and don't mess with Mr. In-Between. Good advice. In 1979, another song was written, and you'll recognize these lyrics. The devil went down to Georgia. He was looking for a soul to steal. He was in a bind because he was way behind, and he was willing to make a deal. And our response is, no deal. Amen. Let us respond by singing hymn number 351, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Please stand as you're able.
Guiding you towards paths of purpose and fulfillment. 